Hi, I'm Femi O.K. And I'm Malika Bilal. Philippines President Rodrigo Duterte says he believes in the competence and capability of women, just not in all aspects of life. We look at how Filipino women are influencing society and whether President Duterte's behavior is sexist or simply taken out of context. You are now live in the stream and on Al Jazeera and YouTube, so leave your comments in the chat. Hi, I'm Christine Hong. I'm a professor at UC Santa Cruz. You're in the stream. President Rodrigo Duterte's strongman governing style and crude sense of humor has often drawn fire from human rights advocates and feminists. But on Sunday, he drew fresh criticism when he asked a married woman to kiss him on the lips during a rally in Seoul, South Korea. The woman says there was no malice in the act, and presidential spokesman Harry Rock contends it was a playful act in line with Filipino culture, which some Filipinos might agree with. For me, that was okay, as long as the woman was okay with it. It seems like she was the one who even requested it. People are just putting malice to it, but it was just a simple kiss. Duterte's critics saw the move as yet another example of what they say is his rampant misogyny. The president's cavalier commentary on sexual assault and recent announcement that the Philippines' next ombudsman would certainly not be a woman has his detractors saying enough is enough. Online, many Filipino women have begun using the hashtag Babayako or I am a woman to highlight what they call Duterte's macho fascism. Take a listen to what the Secretary General of Women's Group, Gabriela, said about the kiss. You don't have to kiss that woman if you want to entertain, entertain people. And the fact that you thought that uh, kissing the woman would uh, entertain people still says something about how you view women. That women are for entertainment, um, that you can uh, express or exercise your authority over another person, especially a woman, is entertainment. That's something really sick. President Duterte on Tuesday said he would resign from office if all offended women signed a petition demanding it. Here now to help us unpack the controversy. Indai Espina Verona is a journalist and also one of the organizers of the hashtag Babayako campaign. She joins us from Manila. Also in Manila, hello, hello. we also have in Manila Antonio Contreras. He's a professor of political science at De La Salle University. And in Canberra, hello. hello there, Antonio. And in Canberra, Australia, Nico Curato is a sociologist as well as a senior research fellow at the University of Canberra. Hello there, Nico. Hello, everybody. Good to have you here. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning to you locally where you are. And hello to everybody else who's watching. OK. Uh, let me show you something on my laptop. Uh, Antonio, one of the things that you study is everyday politics. When we look at this situation here with the president of the Philippines kissing somebody he brought up from the audience, what, what does that tell you about everyday politics in the Philippines? Well, uh, when people say that uh, misogyny is already normalized, then I would agree with that to some extent, because for me it's a structured reality. Uh, many people blame the president for being an agent of misogyny, but I see it differently. I see him as an output of that, an outcome of that, and so as mm. other men. He's not the mm -hmm. only man who's doing that. It doesn't make it right, but at the same time, in order to fight misogyny, you have to look at it more structurally, that it is a product of a worldview. It is a product of the way people think, and it's not just men who are complicit to that. It's also the women who sort of allow it, the women who taught them to be like that, and maybe in this situation, the women who allow themselves to be kissed. So oh, it, come on, the like way everybody to address... was grew up in a misogynist culture and yeah. thought. Well, but no, not no, I'm not, I'm not saying. Grows up to be a misogynist. Well, I'm not... Yeah, but but he's you, you want to understand in life. Yeah, he is the president. But if you are going to zero in on the president, you are missing the point. The point is, in order yeah. to fight misogyny, you don't put it, you don't put it into partisan lenses. Uh -huh. You see, at the moment. I'm more strategic here if we're going to fight because we are on the same page. We don't want misogyny. We just defer and, 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 and argue about how to deal with it. So, guess I'm the just, way some I'm, people, yeah. I, I, I'm just I'm really sorry. curious because almost the second word, Antonio, you said was misogyny. Almost as if there was no debate that the president of the Philippines is a misogynist and he's sexist. I'm, I'm just want to check. Let me just see all of the guests here. Does anyone uh, contend that he's I, not I, sexist? It, is it, does well, anyone, there are oh. people who no, think. Is there any debate? There are people who think that. He, there are people who think that no, he's not. No, even his I, fans. I don't agree. I don't agree. He is sexist. Yeah. 
Yeah, I don't agree that he's not. I'm saying that he is, and yes. so are other men. Right, okay. And so are other men who are probably not demons. You know, the way I see it is that when you demonize misogyny, you're also demonizing fathers and husbands. He's not a bad person, but he's a misogynist. Malika. Yes. So I want to wait. Human, I, I want to bring in... Make um, I, I hear where you're coming from, Antonio, but I want to bring in uh, a couple of comments from Twitter. This is yeah, Jeff. Yeah. He says, Our government is led by a president who displays behavior in public that is disrespectful of women. His mouthpieces spin this by saying, it's part of our culture, even if it isn't. Children see this on TV, and the dignity of women in this country is being damaged by this administration. And uh, Indai, before I, I pass this over to you, I wanted to read one more. This is John who says, I'm in the Philippines, and I don't agree with the president's spokesman who said this is part of our culture. It is never a light moment or acceptable for a sitting president to just kiss someone else's wife, or anyone for that matter, on the lips for mere entertainment. Elected officials should always act responsibly. And I'm wondering your thoughts on this. Okay. The president's um, top aide, Bongo, claimed that, you know, he's a feminist. He loves women, and he's passed um, very progressive laws in his hometown, Davao City. But he has been violating the same law, which states very clearly that you do not abuse women verbally and that you treat women with respect. And this is a president who has continuously abused, demeaned, insulted women. And whenever um, somebody gets his goat up, he, his first reaction is just to heap abuse, and not just any abuse, but abuse that actually centers on womanhood. Mm. Nicole, let me bring you into the conversation here. Let me show you something, though, first of all, Nicole. Uh, some recent compilations. 30 examples of Duterte's sexist remarks. In solidarity with Rabbi yeah. Ayako, here's a compilation of President Duterte's sexist remarks. Duterte and portrayal of women in 10 of his speeches. Like one more here. From fragrant Filipinas to shooting vaginas. Duterte's top six sexist remarks. What impact does this have on the environment between men and women in the Philippines, if anything at all, when the president is obviously viewing women in a certain kind of way? I think one of the curiosities here is, at least for some observers, is that considering how offensive the statements have been, there has been no massive outrage against the presidents on the level of people coming out in the streets, similar to what happened in the United States. And I think one explanation for that is because what the president is doing is it's familiar. It's not necessarily acceptable, but it's familiar. What he's doing is characteristic of the sketch comedy I watched growing up in the 80s. It's characteristic of the noontime show in the Philippines that we see until today. It's something that people know is slightly unacceptable, but it's also something that a lot of Duterte supporters weigh against the president's other characteristics. I think this is what I observed when I studied um, Duterte supporters over the past two years. One of the things I always hear from my respondents, whether these are in slum communities in Manila or disaster affected communities in Central Philippines, is that people understand that this is a flawed president. This is an imperfect person. And yet this person is not one dimensional. This is the same person who brought home distressed Filipino workers from the Middle East. This is the same person who is on the scene when a disaster happens. This is not to say that his sexism is acceptable, but what I'm arguing here is that based on my observations, people weigh the kinds of values, the characteristics that the president presents. And I think that's an important insight because there's a tendency to portray the president's supporters as unthinking, as duped by this charismatic leader, but that's not necessarily the case. I think there's a lot of room, there's a lot of scope for debating the values um, that people have. And I guess the headline is it's familiar, but not necessarily acceptable. Mm. I'm glad that you uh, raised that yeah, because I, mean, I wanted to bring in one no, of his actually, supporters. A lot of his uh, supporters and I, I want to bring in one of his said. supporters here on Twitter. This is Lynn. She says, then Mayor Duterte was the main driving force for why the city's gender code came into fruition, which other provinces patterned their own gender codes and where our own country's gender code was patterned after. He got important things done for women than those so-called decent politicians have. And I, what do you make of what she's saying? What she's saying is exactly what I was saying, that there might, have, there might be a progressive code in Davao City, but this is a chief executive who thinks he's above that code and above that law. And while maybe some of them might be weighing um, his decisiveness 
we have we what he what he treat, how he treats women like the truth is that a lot of the Turkish supporters have come out and saying we can't have that either because like if this is the way he treats our mothers our wives our sisters our children you know that's just not unacceptable and it also actually keeps a toxic atmosphere between men and women and while those noon time shows are indeed familiar i think enough women have also been speaking out against the kind of verbal violence that they do spread in those shows and his president I also want to, he should be more responsible uh, uh, i also want to add that uh, in the case it, of davao yeah, city okay. um just a very quick comment that yes of course um then mayor duterte was responsible for these ordinances that protect women but let's not forget that this is a product of civil society groups who are lobbied by women themselves and i think it's just not fair to say that it's the president the only person that instituted these laws in davao it's a product of long struggle of women's movements in the city that made these anti-sexual harassment laws um in davao possible and I I think that's the case nationally now with President Duterte every time he makes policies or endorses policies that are pro women it's not the president single handedly steering the country to a direction that benefits some women we have to give credit to women's movements who have always been pushing for these policies Antonio what were you going to say can I say something uh, yeah Antonio please can I say something yeah please yes uh I I I would just like to follow up on what Nicole said earlier about the complexity and the nuances that the problem is that if misogyny which is a complex problem its roots are complex its implications are complex its manifestations are complex if, if we simplify simplify this as a question of good and bad a question of black and white then and it becomes partisan then my worry is that people would really go back to their partisan cave, caves and 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 grounds and comfort zones the point is it's it's correct the president is misogynist Now the problem is how do you see that is that because is the Philippines misogynist because the president is misogynist as some people would like to say that misogyny is now rearing an ugly head because the president is a misogynist or it is precisely because we already have a structured misogyny in our society that the president and the speaker of the house and the senate president tend to be misogynist that is important no he's made it official moment, misogyny let, let, let me finish let me let me finish in that uh, the 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 point is if you're going to put that in partisan lenses instead of convincing people to your side then it becomes a partisan war and therefore you miss the point of a learning teaching it becomes a teaching learning moment then you miss that because people will tend to go back to their partisan biases that's what i fear because nicole precisely described this the situation uh we the people see that as problematic but it's familiar No, no the way i see it is giving him a pass when he shouldn't be given a free pass no, because he is president give, and there are laws there are laws in tonya well yeah, why are you letting him get away with it we're, we're because he's president so because it's okay no 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 So Antonio well, is, and Indai, I hear where you're coming from. On the one hand, uh, Indai, you say the public is letting him get away with this. And on the other hand, Antonio, you mentioned something uh, that I had to write down here, structural misogyny. We all realize it's there in your words. I want to play on that with this video comment that we got from Ruben James, who pitched the idea for today's show that we're doing. And he talks about the impact of that structural misogyny. Have a listen. President Rodrigo Duterte's misogynistic remarks on women have translated into more brutal, violent, and distasteful attacks against them during his administration. In his speeches, he always mentions about the binary distinction of what's biologically male and what's biologically female. And with this kind of distinction, it sets a social construction of what's the function of women in society. And this kind of thinking limits them into a more power structure disadvantage. Nicole, I want to pass that one over to you and the people that you talk to. Uh, do the ideas that he brings up in his video comment resonate with them, that there is a, a structural issue here? 
Um, well, it's not articulated as such, but it's ov very obvious that there are clear gendered implications of President Duterte's policies. I think what I want to emphasize here as well is that while his vulgar words matter, I think words matter, I think they're offensive, and the president definitely must not have a free pass. But I think we also have to focus on something more latent, things that are clearly gendered but not articulated because the president is not drawing attention to them. So, for example, the president's bloody war on drugs. The main victims here are women. These are widows. These are mothers who lost their loved ones. Um, sometimes I feel like when the president says something sexist on camera, we tend to focus on that, which is obviously important. But I think we also have to draw attention to something that's less overt and give voice to women who don't have as much voice when it comes to um, this issue. And I think the challenging part here is that some of the women we've talked to, not a lot, but some of the women we talked to, unfortunately see the president as the only person who can help them with their conditions. So we've talked to widows of the drug war who actually blame the police for the killings of their husbands. And they would actually think that the president who portrays himself as a father figure is the only person that can help them. Can we blame these women for thinking that this is the only president, the sexist president that can help them? Not necessarily. And I think this is how my ideas speak to Professor Contreras' ideas, that this is a structural issue. If our courts were working, if our police were less corrupt, then these women would not pin their hopes on a president who may offend feminist sensibilities, but also portrays himself as someone who helps women. It's very tricky. I'm incredibly frustrated. And I really count on people like Indai and the Bayaho movement to help piece these together because it's incredibly complex and frustrating. So guess I want Speaking to play Indai. Indai, sit, sit tight for a second because I, I, I want to get straight to where you're going to. But I want to share something with our audience who are watching right now. Um, uh, the humor of President Duterte uh, is, is questionable. But it definitely flows along the, the idea of women are there as a, a punchline. So we put together some clips to give you an example of that. Uh, and then I'm going to go straight to Endai. Have a look. Uh, <laughs> He's a promising virgins uh, when you go to heaven. I'd like to have the virgins here, not in heaven. <laughs> God may not allow it. Um, cursing, whistling, or calling a woman in public with words having dirty connotations or implications um, is actually sexual harassment. So it seems as if you uh, violated your own ordinance. Do you have any reaction or statement on this? You know, you don't have any business Stopping me ever. That is a freedom of expression. So much material right there, but it wasn't any of those instances in Dai that influenced you setting up a movement. It was this headline here. Next ombudsman won't be a woman, Duterte says. That was that was the final straw, right? That may have been the final straw for a lot of Babaya call mm. um, people involved, but I've been writing every time he's come out with a sexist, misogynist statement. Let's get that clear. Okay, but speaking of Babai Ako, um, when Nicole speaks of um, widows of drug war victims and mothers of drug war victims, many of them are with Babai Ako. And, the and women, I explain, the, mothers, explain uh, yes. the thinking behind it. Babai Ako is, I am a woman. And then I alongside that, there is, I will fight. So this movement has, has, has got two important rallying cries. Unpack them for us. OK, it's not just misogyny, although misogyny is a big part of it, OK? It's also that many in Babai Ako see that this misogyny is only really a reflection of a lot of other fatal flaws in Duterte, including the autocratic streak that has led to a drug war that has killed thousands of Filipinos. And many of the mothers and the wives of those who have fallen in the drug war are with Babai Ako because they know, they see their plight, you know, as a reflection of a continuum of Duterte's tendencies. And it's not just misogyny. Misogyny is actually a reflection of how feudal he is when he says that, you know, nobody can stop me, nobody can question me. That is exactly his problem. And that is how it comes out 
in misogyny. So misogyny is only a reflection, but it is something that angers a lot of women. And I wanted to share uh, the viewpoint of someone who's involved in the campaign as well. Malina says on Twitter that Babayako is meant to empower all of us women who have been demeaned and ridiculed no end by this misogynistic president, she says. It's about time for us to rise up and give him a taste of his own bitter medicine. We also got a video comment may, from someone. May, may, may I, I, want, I want to play I this video something? comment first because she follows up on that, that tweet very nicely. This is no my no me. And she says why she is part of this campaign. Have a listen. The Babaya call campaign, I am woman, is to call attention and push back against misogyny, but also to call attention on Duterte's attacks against institutions of justice headed by women. What is the point of laws to protect women, like the Magna Carta for women, laws on anti-violence against women and their children, if the men in power exhibit chauvinistic misogynistic and sexist privilege. I, I want to give that to you, yes, Antonio. I, I wanted to, to get yes, Antonio's yes. take on the campaign and, and what you think of it. Well, when we say we want to protect all women, then you have a problem of consistency. And this is what some people see, that some feminists and some women's activists and some people who fight for women's rights say, tend to be seen as selective. And this is because they are seen in a partisan lens. For example, there, there are people who condemn Duterte for, for, for doing certain things that are seemingly assaulting women or attacking women. And yet when the women who are victims are not on the right or correct political line, then they don't say anything. Uh, let me give you an example. This recent uh, controversy about the kissing in Korea, uh, uh, Miss Kim, Bea Kim, who is the name of the woman who, who was kissed, uh, that was seen as an attack against a woman. And yet here you are now, for example, Moka Uson, who has been in the controversy with the former pre the president, the, the daughter of former president, uh, of the, the, the sister of former president uh, Noino Aquino. They are in a, in a quarrel right now. And then the president and Bongo apologized on behalf of Moka Uson, which for me is objectifying. You know, why do you have to apologize for a woman? You have to ask her first. Now, that is not seen as an assault on women's subjectivity, and, and it's not seen as objectification. So many people would like to buy into the issue, and yet when they begun to see it as more as a partisan attack on the president, instead of going into the structural roots of the problem, because it is selective, when it is Sereno or, or, or Laila de Lima or Robredo being attacked, they, they, they complain. But when it is Moka Uson or... Chief Associate Justice De Castro, or also women. Anio, and, and tell you, I just have a, just a, very, a very quick question for you. So this, I'm going to call it a women's movement. You don't buy it? You don't think it's necessary in the Philippines? No, no. It's necessary, but it has to be caught in the point. It, it, there has to be, it has to be decoupled from partisanship. Because the moment it becomes partisan, then instead of looking at the problem in a... In a in a, in, a, in a feminist perspective or patriarchy is the enemy or misogyny, then you go back to the issue. It's just being said because those who are mm. at the top of the movement, at the front of the and movement... And I, Antonio saying, says you're being well, political. the most glaring... Now, of I'm course it's political. Is person, by the the way. personal is I'm political, not Antonio. I know her personal. And you've got women being raped when you have the president is the most glaring example of the most extreme forms of misogyny. Of mm. course it is and political. I, what are we that's supposed that's to that's say? That's a problem. You know, and when I, you say and I women, Antonio, I, I, I hear what you're saying right now. I'm just very curious because we're in the last 30 seconds of this show. Uh, this is an online women's movement yes. for equality for women uh, in the Philippines. What next? I know that you're planning some marches, taking offline and then into real life. And I? We are going on, we are going on ground. Mm -hmm. We're having a Babaya march on June 12, Independence Day. Okay. And we're going to be standing up and say, enough, not just of misogyny, uh -huh. but all the autocratic and abusive tendencies of okay. this president. And I, Nicole, Antonio, thank you so much for joining us today. I will leave the conversation for Malika to wrap up. No, I give this to Candy, who says that this movement empowers us to express suppressed anguish simply by promoting us to finish the thought. Many women don't get to tell their stories, and this campaign helps them process their pain. Of course, you can continue this conversation online, hashtag AJStream and at AJStream on Twitter.